Hi everybody, this is Art Owen. I'm gonna be telling you about ridge functions and quasi Monte Carlo. I'll share a screen and here we go. So this is a talk about ridge functions. My co-author is Christopher Hoyt. He is a PhD student in uh, computational mathematics and engineering at Stanford. The results that I'll show you today are based on our article that has appeared or will soon be appearing in SINOM. First, let me tell you what is a ridge function. We have a function f of x. x has a d-dimensional space, a d-dimensional domain. And then a ridge function is of the form g of theta transpose x. So in two dimensions, you could actually fold up a piece of paper and it would look you know, normal to theta and it would look like a ridge. Of course, it can also happen in higher dimensions. More generally, f of x could depend on our different projections of x. So theta could be a matrix, a d by r matrix, and then g is a function that takes r dimensions into one scalar value. We are interested especially in the case where r is much smaller than d. r might be one or two or three. It's convenient to normalize this matrix theta, so it can be orthonormal, and when r is one, it's simply a unit vector. Ridge functions are pretty good news for the quasi Monte Carlo world. There's work by Paul Constantine on active subspaces. He has a monograph from 2015. What Paul finds is that ridge functions are ubiquitous in the physical sciences and engineering. Somebody works really hard to make a function with dozens or hundreds of variables in their computer. Paul then finds, you know, it's approximately a ridge function with some small number r. Integrands that are dominated by their low dimensional aspects are very favorable for quasi Monte Carlo. In this talk, what I want to show you is that smooth ridge functions are dominated by low dimensional aspects. Well, putting that all together, it means quasi Monte Carlo should generally be really quite effective in physical science problems. Many of those problems, they're really trying to optimize their function or approximate it or do something else, but integration is a pretty fundamental task. So there should be lots of good use cases for randomized and unrandomized quasi Monte Carlo in the physical sciences. With a little bit of finer print, f of x is usually only approximately the ridge function. So it could be this function plus some small error. But when you take an average of a small error, it's still gonna be small. The low dimensional parts, they need to be regular enough to benefit from quasi Monte Carlo. And there's work by Griebel, Quo, and Sloan show that if you have a, say, a discontinuous function in high dimensions, it may effectively be close to a smooth one. All of the ANOVA components might be smooth except for the very highest one. And we're gonna use mean dimension instead of effective dimension. It's easier to get a theoretical and a computational handle on mean dimension. Okay, let me, uh, let me spoil that, the storyline. What we find is that sometimes the mean dimension is just constant or big O of one as d goes to infinity. As the nominal dimension grows, the mean dimension remains bounded. Other times, the mean dimension can be seen and shown to grow like the square root of the nominal dimension. Oh, those are quite different. And what makes a difference? Smoothness of G makes a difference. And a second order thing is sparsity of theta or capital theta. That makes a difference too. And I want to tout a trick called pre-integration. Pre-integration can turn one of these into one of those. I'll show you an example later. Okay, randomized quasi Monte Carlo. That's the method I'm going to use. In particular, I'll use, I'll be talking about scrambled digital nets. They have a lot of favorable properties. I strongly advocate for randomized quasi Monte Carlo for several reasons. First of all, if it's important to have a small error, then it's important to know you have a small error and show you have a small error. And you can best do that using some randomizations and get data from your actual function. It's not enough to know that you know, a, a theoretical bound because they usually have a constant that you don't know, like total variation or, or the norm in some Hilbert space. And without knowing that, you don't really know if you've achieved your error bound. Another nice thing about randomized quasi Monte Carlo is that you don't need the integrand to be bounded variation. Bounded variation can be pretty strict uh, condition. 
If f is in L2, then randomized quasi Monte Carlo is set to go. Recently, f really only needs to be in just a little bit more than L1. This is some joint work with Daniel Rudolph. The motivating problem came from some AI researchers at Facebook, and they wanted a strong law of large numbers for randomized quasi Monte Carlo for their problems. And it's really nice to see in the machine learning and AI world finding uses for quasi Monte Carlo. And I was quite happy with those results that Daniel and I got. Another thing I like about randomized quasi Monte Carlo, it plays nice with the ANOVA decomposition. So especially when you scramble nets, it plays nicely with the ANOVA decomposition. Okay, let's look in a Gaussian setting. X can be a high dimensional spherical Gaussian random variable. And then theta transpose X, because theta is orthonormal, it's a low dimensional spherical Gaussian random variable. And if theta would be a vector, then it's just a scalar Gaussian. So that's a pretty nice simplification. And let's let this uh, phi, or for LaTeX folks among you, var phi, let that be a Gaussian density, spherical Gaussian density. Then the mean that we're after, it's the integral of a ridge function against that Gaussian density. And because this ridge quantity, theta transpose x, is also a Gaussian, it's really this low dimensional Gaussian integral, or g of z or z, however you like it, is integrated against an r dimensional Gaussian density. Similarly, the variance reduces to an integral against r dimensions. And these integrals, the mean and the variance, they're the same for all dimensions d. In the Monte Carlo context, that means this problem is just as hard by Monte Carlo in any dimension d. It might cost you a little more to evaluate it, but in terms of its distribution, it's the same in all dimensions d. Then in quasi Monte Carlo, we can take a look-see. We can change g for fixed d, or we can change d for fixed g. So we have a notion that this is the same function in different dimensions, or we can look at the dimension and change the smoothness. It's a good, it's a good class of functions to poke around that and see how quasi Monte Carlo works. We're going to use the notation from the ANOVA. There really isn't time to say exactly what the ANOVA is. I'll just refresh your memories about the ANOVA notation. For an ANOVA to work, X needs to have independent components. We'll have D independent components. And the indices are just one to D, which um, I call one to D. And then we'll let U be a subset of those indices. And then X sub U, that's all the xj's where j belongs to u. So it's a subvector or a subtuple, whatever you like to call it. Now, in this ANOVA decomposition, we start with f in L2. And we write it as a sum of two to the d functions, f sub u. Those functions are called effects. If u would be a singleton, then it's a main effect. If u would be a doubleton, it's a two-factor interaction. And the higher ones are three and four-factor interactions. And what's salient about this f u, it only depends on x sub u, not the rest of x. f sub empty set, well, it can't depend on any variables. It's got to be a constant function, and we choose it to be the mean that we're trying to estimate. Now, all of these effects have variances, and because it's in L2, and we call these variance components. And one good reason to call them variance components is that the variance of the function f of x is a sum of those various components that decomposes. This is just one decomposition. There's an anchor decomposition and some quite general decompositions are discussed in this paper by Quo, Sloan, Wazelkowski, and Wojnikowski. Now, scrambled nets work really nicely with the ANOVA decomposition. So we'll take a scrambled net endpoints in D dimensions. And then we'll translate it into things that should be roughly Gaussian by taking the Gaussian inverse CDF. In fact, in a scrambled net, each UI will be independent, uniform, and so each XI will have a Gaussian distribution. The quantity we're trying to estimate is this expectation, F times the Gaussian. And the estimate that we use is simply the average of these F of XIs. And if we plug in the ANOVA, f of xi has a constant term and then the other terms. This constant term is the answer that we're after. And so right here, this is our error. And each of these mu hats, there's one for every non-empty subset of variables. And it's the average of that ANOVA effect on, that, on the data. 
And these, there's an orthogonality or an uncorrelated property under scrambled net sampling. So our mean squared error is just a sum of mean squared errors from each of these effects. And it's also little o of one over n for um, f in L2. When quasi Monte Carlo and randomized quasi Monte Carlo are working well, the story is like this. This subset U can have small cardinality or large cardinality. When it has small cardinality, the X's are projected down into a small space and the quasi Monte Carlo rates start to show up at practical sample sizes. So we might get n to the minus two or n to the minus three mean squared error, maybe, maybe not long terms. For large U, we simply cannot afford a sample size n big enough to attain the asymptote. However, we can't be much worse than the Monte Carlo rate, some sigma u squared over n by some small constant multiple. Well, if sigma u squared is negligible, then this Monte Carlo rate is just fine. So we get little errors here because u is small and little errors here because u is big. Well, this is going to work if the function is dominated by its low dimensional parts. The mean dimension is one way to tell or to quantify how dominated the function is by its low dimensional parts. So let's take all true to the D subsets and look at their cardinalities ranging from zero to D. We multiply each of them by a variance component and normalize it. These normalized variance components sum to one. So now we're looking at an average dimensionality for the function f, the mean dimension. This expression looks a little cumbersome because you have to add up two to the d terms. However, there's a sweet identity. You can do it by just adding d Sobel indices. You don't even have to estimate the individual sigma u's. So these, you can get the numerator of this quantity by adding up d Sobel indices. Here's an example integrand from the literature in a paper by Kuo, Schwab, and Sloan. They looked at this integral, or this integrand. And a bit of numerical work, you can show that the mean dimension of that thing was well, more than 1.003 and less than 1.007. So the 99% confidence interval. Okay, so that thing is nearly additive. It'll have an effective dimension of one. And then if you look at the formula, of course, it's gotta be nearly additive. We've got J going into the hundreds and J factorial will completely obliterate that corresponding XJ. So only the first few have a chance to matter. And then we kind of know how many or how far in it can matter. Only a few interactions can matter. Well, we're gonna look at some ridge functions. The simplest one has R equals one and the following unit vector, everybody is one over square root of D. Okay, so that's a simple unit vector. So that unit vector times X will have a normal zero one distribution. And now we can change G and see what happens. Well, the first G we'll look at is a Gaussian CDF shifted by a threshold T. Now the Gaussian CDF is an extremely smooth function. We pick a T that's not zero just you know, to rule out any weird symmetries or anything. So it's kind of a bit more general of a function than if we had made it symmetric. And then a much less smooth one is a step function. It's zero to the left of the threshold and it's one to the right. In between is a kink. If you integrate a step, you get a kink. So it's zero to the left of T. It increases linearly from T on. This is the positive part function. In a neural net world, they call it the, um, the ReLU function for the, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, there's a linear unit. So, Let's look at the smooth function. So the smooth function, we take G of that linear combination of the X's and calculate its mean dimension. The nominal dimension is going to be one or two or four or eight or 16 or 32. So we look at a sample of nominal dimensions. Those nominal dimensions go up to 35 billion. And the mean dimension, doesn't go that far. If t would be zero, then the mean dimension asymptotes around 1.1. You move a little bit further into the tail, then the asymptote is just below 1.2 as a mean dimension. 
And if you go further into the tail, the asymptote grows and it's somewhat more than 1.4. And these were computed numerically. At the end of these slides, there's a discussion of how to do that. It was five independent Sobel index or Sobel uh, randomized computations, except they plot right on top of each other. So you can hardly tell that there was five independent replicates. Now let's look at the jump discontinuity. For the jump discontinuity, we have a nominal dimension going just past 10 to the eight. And now the mean dimension, we're in log-log scale, it goes up to about 10 to the four. There's a reference line here. The blue reference line has mean dimension equal to the square root of the nominal dimension. The green curve is for a little bit out in the tail. If the threshold would be at t equals two, then it would be some multiple of the square root of d. That's what it appears to be. Compute it five times. Pretty, pretty solid down here. Starts to show randomness up here. And then if we move the threshold into one or zero, it comes much, much closer to the square root of d. And five independent computations you can see out here. We don't really know what the mean dimension is, but uh, down here it seems to be pretty solid and stable. Now let's look at that kink. So again, we take the sum of the x's divided by the square root of d, and we pass it through this uh, rectified linear unit function or positive part, the max of zero and z minus t. Okay, well, what should happen? Should it look like the step or should it look like the smooth function? Well, it's going to give you infinite variation in the sense of Hardy and cross, just like the step. So maybe it should look like the step. And again, it has a weak derivative. There's only one weak derivative. This thing has all the derivatives. But you know, so maybe it should be like this function, maybe it should be like that function. Well, let's find out. Okay, so here we go. We take this sum of the x's and divide by square root of d, pass it through the positive part function. Nominal dimension is going up to 35 billion. And if the cutoff would be at zero, then the mean dimension comes up to just below 1.5. If we put the cutoff out in the right tail at t equals two, then the mean dimension is close to four. Okay, so mean dimension of close to four means that the effective dimension could probably be a lot more than four. So it's not necessarily low effective dimension in this function. Although the effective dimension will, of course, be way less than 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 9, but it could be some multiple of 4. At the, if the threshold is at minus 2, then this function is, has mean dimension barely bigger than 1. Okay, so those are some examples, and we have a theorem. And the theorem allows for the function g to be whole or continuous. And the theorem, uh, you can see it in the paper, what I'll show you now are two special case corollaries. So if G would be Lipschitz, okay, so the holder constant alpha equals one. In that case, the mean dimension is below R, that's how many projections we're using, times the square of the Lipschitz constant over the variance. Okay, so D goes to infinity, mean dimension remains bounded. If we look at R equals one, for R equals one, you can nicely state the mean dimension bound, and if you have a holder constant alpha, then the mean dimension will be like d to the one minus alpha. Well, if the mean dimension is growing like d to some polynomial, that's probably a pretty tough case. I think that's not going to be a good case for quasi Monte Carlo. And the implied constants in these big O are in the paper. Well, now let's take a look at the step function. So the step function, it's just one if theta transpose x is above the threshold, and we work out that the upper bound for the mean dimension is like square root of d log b. And we can be a little bit more precise. Where does that come from? Well, it has in it the uh, L1 norm of the vector theta. And so the L1 norm responds to sparsity. The most that can be is the square root of d, as it was in the example that we gave you. But if theta would be sparse, this can be a lot less. And over here is a number of non-zero elements in theta. That's another sparsity-related quantity. So sparsity makes a difference. The other thing that makes a difference is the threshold. So on this bound, if t would go way into the tail, 
then either this one or that one will be extremely small, and then this upper bound on nu will be quite, quite high. Um, it's actually quite conservative. It's unrealistically large. With a bit more effort, we get a lower bound. So the mean dimension, it's at least the L1 norm of theta times some things. Well, the L1 of norm of theta could be square root of d, or it could be much smaller. Okay, so it's stuck between square root of d and square root of d log d. Now, let me tell you about pre-integration. In pre-integration, we'll integrate out one of the d variables. This is from Griewark, Quo, Bilbo, and Sloan. Okay, so here's a function f of x. It depends on d variables. Let's just integrate out one of them, xl. And maybe we do that in closed form, or maybe we have to use some sort of quadrature method, but we'll just get rid of it. And then we're left with a function that just depends on d minus one variables. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. This f tilde is also gonna be a ridge function. If you put a ridge function into this pre-integration, then you get a ridge function out of the pre-integration. It'll change g and it'll change theta. It'll still be a ridge function. What you can get though, is you can get a Lipschitz function out when the one that went in wasn't Lipschitz. For example, if a step function goes in, you can get a Lipschitz function out. You can even get that the mean dimension of f grows like square root of d, while the pre-integrated one grows like order one, it's bounded. So that is actually astonishing. We're used to telling people that, you know, Fubini doesn't really work well in high dimension. You know, you can't like integrate your integrals uh, and expect things to be better. But here actually it is true. If you integrate one thing in closed form and then use quasi Monte Carlo on the rest, you can get a big improvement. If you're going to do this pre-integration, you don't, don't pick theta L equals zero. That doesn't do anything. You want to pick one, if you can, that has a big theta. And if that theta is bounded away from zero as d goes to infinity, then you can get something like this phenomenon happening. Okay, so two conclusions to show you, to share with you. First, rich functions are pretty common in the physical science and engineering world. And smooth ones will have a low mean dimension. So I think there must be lots of good use cases for quasi Monte Carlo and randomized quantity Monte Carlo in the physical and engineering sciences. The second one is that pre-integration of an important variable can be astonishingly effective. It can turn a problem from QMC unfriendly into QMC friendly. I'd like to mention a couple other works in progress. Uh, Chris and I have been looking at the mean dimension of radial basis functions, and they typically come out very close to one for large d for the radial basis functions that people use. And then, some neural nets are basically ridge functions of ridge functions of ridge functions of ridge functions. And there's an MNIST data set that Chris and I have been looking at. We put seven or so hundred pixel inputs in, and just before that final normalization softmax layer, the mean dimension is pretty regularly between 1.5 and two. So out of those 700 plus variables, they're mostly being used one or two or three or a few at a time. You don't have any meaningful tenfold interactions in whatever that function is doing. A lot of people to thank. I want to thank Christopher Hoyt. It's been a delight to work with him, and he's been you know, very productive on lots of these projects. I want to thank the National Science Foundation for all of the support they've offered over the years. I want to thank the organizers of this conference, Mike Giles, Arnaud Doucet, and the other people that were working with them. I don't even know all the names, but I know that there's more people helping. I especially want to thank Alex Keller. Alex Keller stepped in and really helped make this conference um, come out the way it should. So he, I don't know all of the things that he did. I just know he did a lot and I'm very grateful for what he did. I think I might have a smidgen of more time. So I want to show you something about the Keister function. So the Keister function is a radial basis function. Take the cosine of norm x over two, where x is Gaussian. It's motivated by problems in physics. So it's thought that this is representative of some problems in physics. And on this axis, we have the square root of the nominal dimension. This axis, it's the mean dimension. It oscillates periodically between one and two. And so why is that happening? Well, with a little bit of Taylor theorem and central limit theorem, the norm of x over two, it's approximately Gaussian, with mean root d over two and variance one quarter. 
Now, a variance of one quarter means a standard deviation of a half. Plus or minus three halves, that goes over a range of six. The period of the cosine function is about, um, I'm sorry, the range of the thing is about three. It's about half the period of the cosine function. So if this is centered on a linear part of the cosine function, it's just going to look linear and the mean dimension will be one. If it's centered on a mode, then it's almost purely quadratic. You square this uh, x, you get sum of xj squared, and so you'd have mean dimension two. So that's why that is working that way. And I'll stop share and end.